You're listening to Discography Discussion, episode 117, P.O.D., featuring Brian Patton of As the Story Grows. Here comes the boom. Hosted by Dan Terry. Ready? <laughs> or, or not. <laughs> and Joe Wren. At some point, you implode and become a black hole. I'm going to be Lemmy before the end of the day, I'm sure. Presented by DiscussMetal.com. And if you let the music speak for itself, but it only lets you down... Then you are ready for this episode of Discography Discussion. I am Joe. That is Dan. Brian Patton is here from the As the Story Grows podcast. What would you say you do here, Brian? Oh, man. (laughs) That's not even my intro. I I should really change it. (laughs) I know. there's There's a part of it at the end where somebody's like, you got this, Travis. Make him wait for it. Boom. And then I'm like, but it's not travis though <laughs> he, he sent me all the parts to redo the intro but he didn't send me all the parts and all the music and i was like well the music is the most important part so i just left it the way it is and yeah it's fine should replace it with like just something like really like something that would just instantly turn off like everybody I, we have a theme song that bob nana from braid did so i yeah, should that's just put great. that at the beginning yeah, I actually do like that song quite a bit. I, like, I'll listen to, to the end of the interview just to hear it a lot of the time. I should put that at the beginning. Speaking of a band that I really didn't listen to all the way through to the end, I mean, I did, because unfortunately that's what we do here. <laughs> but uh, there were a few albums where I definitely did not want to listen all the way to the end. Here comes the boom! We are talking about P.O.D. or Payable on Death, depending on how familiar, familiar you are with banking terms. Con Diddy, bye-bye! And that's the last time I get to say that on this episode. (laughs) Well, before we testify about P.O.D., I want to take this time to say thank you to everyone for listening to the podcast. Thank you for listening and for subscribing. If you are not a subscriber, then you can find everything Discography Discussion at DiscussMetal.com. We are on Spotify, Apple and Google Podcasts, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher. So if you have an Amazon Echo or Google Home, you have no excuse. Ask it to play the latest episode of the Discography Discussion podcast, and it will. We're also on Facebook and on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Be sure to like, favorite, and subscribe. It really helps us out. It lets us know you're listening, and now Dan is going to tell us all about five-star reviews. Leave me a five-star review. I mean, I think we've been we've been friends long enough, and uh, I think it's time. Reviews really are the lifeblood of most podcasts in the sense that you're not going to get recommended or any kind of exposure on all of these various podcast platforms if you don't get any reviews. And we are very thankful that we've gotten a lot of reviews on Apple Podcasts and various other platforms that we've been on. But uh, that's really the best thing that you could do for a podcast is leave them a review and uh, send us a message. Say hello. And now Brian is going to tell us all about As the Story Grows. As the Story Grows, we've, uh, I feel like we've been killing it lately. We've had a lot of, and, and like, uh, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I feel like we've had some great interviews with, uh, uh, Jason Stinson from Overcome, Tim Mann from Focused, uh, Doug from Roadside Monument this week, Orlando Greenhill from Avalina Railco. Just like tremendous interviews with uh, these pioneers of the old tooth and nail scene and 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 hardcore, and it's it's been amazing. Yeah, that Doug Venable one was really good. Um, it was short but sweet. It's kind of frustrating how short that was because both Brian and Adam from Hope Soul were like, oh, he's great. He'll talk to you forever. And he did not. He was just like, yep, here we go. <laughs> but uh, no, I like that interview, though. And it was so interesting because like Hope's Fall is a weird band in that like they have like zero drama in their band, like zero. Like every single time somebody's like, oh, well, why'd you leave the band? Oh, I don't know. I just felt like it one day. Yeah. Like, cause I remember when I talked to Adam uh, on my other podcast, he was like, you know, he's like, yeah, you know, I just, I just thought it was my time to leave. I want to do some other stuff. And then you're talking to Doug and Doug's like, yeah, I just, you know, it's just over it. You know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> it was just so funny. Uh, I don't know if we ever got into the nitty gritty as to why Ryan left, but uh, I think Travis did a little bit when he talked to him. Yeah, I think I did. It's not super complicated. I just think it was just his time to leave and do something else. So. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's the story with Hope's Fall. I remember being like, you know, did you guys ever get any 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 flack for stopping being a Christian band? And he's like, no, not really. You know, yeah. and I'm just like, wow, okay. Hope's Fall, like, never had any problems. No, I think it was super cool and super chill, and, and maybe this is overstepping my relational boundary here. But uh, they're recording a new album right now, 
And cool. it is the Satellite Years era band with Ryan Parrish. Oh, nice. So, so that's that'll awesome. be awesome. Spoilers. <laughs> spoiler, spoiler alert. That has not been announced because record labels are weird. But if you follow everybody on Instagram, like you, you would know. You could piece it together. That's cool. We're not like blabbermouth, so not yet. Have you met Dan Terry? <laughs> I do blabber on and on. 1994, Snuff the Punk. Oh, man, Snuff the Punk. Now, obviously, and I think a lot of P.O.D. fans can attest to this, this was not the first album that I heard by P.O.D. This no? is kind of a... No, it was not. Uh, I mean, I do consider myself to be a pretty old school fan of P.O.D., but I got into them more during the Brown era. And what was weird is that I bought Snuff the Punk at a Walmart. <laughs> this was after Fundamental Elements had come out. So this was would be the re-release? It's the re- it is absolutely the re-release. And I didn't know that there were two versions until I was at a Goodwill looking through CDs. Cause I mean, you can, you know, as, as, as hipster as it might sound, you can find some good shit in thrift stores. And I stumbled upon an actual copy of the snuff, the punk in its original glory with its original artwork and everything. And I remember putting the CD in and being like, Oh, this sounds kind of like shit compared to my remaster. And so I sold it on eBay and it wasn't even listed anywhere, but some dude bought it for like 80 bucks crazy it's the most money i've ever made on a cd on ebay like, nice like vinyl i could i could see it but for a cd what's the most profit you made on ebay in one sale that would probably be a one of my video games which was a copy of it was the game was called shining the holy ark on sega saturn it's an rpg nobody ever heard of it but the dude that bought it had heard of it and he wanted it so <laughs> who was i who was i to stand in his way he went through a pretty vicious bidding war, but yeah, it was like, it was like upwards of like two hundred bucks, which was insane. Because like I thought the game was like mediocre. Off topic a little bit with that, but uh, mediocre <laughs> like this album. Well, this is not their finest work, but it's their first work, so you can't really like judge it too harshly. And then it's like, hey, it's the first time we made noise on a record. But this is interesting because, so a song from Snuff the Punk actually appeared on an old tooth and nail compilation that i think we're all familiar with uh helpless among friends and i actually had that on cassette so i guess you could say that i I had heard pod before but like for whatever reason when i heard him on brown or whatever like i wasn't thinking about that compilation or that old song and uh this is this is a very different pod than i think a lot of people are used to this is much more like hardcore i guess like it's got a little bit of that hardcore tough guy sound to it for the early 90s it was really weird seeing them on compilations with bands like strong arm or i don't know if it was strong arm but it was like with focused and uh unashamed like it was weird how that all fit together so well on that compilation yeah no i lars got rich from npr music recently posted on facebook uh he had a question about this record and he said hey remember when pod sounded like shelter which yeah. was which was funny when he said that because I never made that comparison. But when he said it, I was like, "Oh, I can kind of see that comparison to Shelter." But like, yeah, "Draw the Line" is is the hit on that record, which ended up on their first Warriors EP because it's so different from the rest of this record, which is like everything is like super fast punk with super fast rapping, and it's this weird bad brains meets Rage Against the Machine thing that's like weird and and the lyrics are all over the place and it, it's kind of indicative of pod as a band in general of like how kind of good and how kind of cheesy sunny can be as a lyricist <laughs> i'm glad you brought up the bad brains rage against the machine comparison i get the same vibe listening to this that i do listening to the self-titled project 86 where that's basically rage against the machine this is basically Bad Brains plus Rage Against the Machine, like you said. This was much yeah. more original. I can give it that. Like, I kind of enjoyed listening to it, but I was like, this is a little too old school for me as far as, like, the rap, like the style of rapping and that sort of stuff. But, like, there are moments that are pretty good. Like, there's a song on there called Run, which I thought was pretty good. Like, it's, it's sloppy, but, you know, a lot of the songs up here were sloppy. Right. <laughs> uh, and, but that's like part of the appeal. Like it doesn't really take away the sloppiness and the rawness is really what saves it a lot of the time. Just right. because it if was it, so energetic. Right. Like you can understand the appeal if it was the first thing from the band you heard and you were not engaged in that style of music or that scene. 
And you can also, if you went back to it, you can hear the potential in it, which I think is is really compelling because it it has something from both those perspectives. This is also when they were the most zealous as far as like their faith in music goes. And it's the kind of the same story with a lot of bands like Purity, where they start off so Christian that it like it probably could turn people off just like how strong the approach is. I think on this album they hadn't really learned the art of subtlety yet or how to make it or how to make it sound artful. You know, but again, if you if you if you're sounding like bad brains or, or rage against the machine, subtlety isn't, you know, part of the equation. It's you you're you're ha- you have like thirty minutes to, to just expel every single thing that you think about a variety of topics and uh he definitely succeeds in that like a hundred percent right it's like the same era of like earth crisis where it's like yeah whatever your message was you're going to be militant about it and there's no subtlety in hardcore in those days but i would say the party really got started with pod no pun intended was on brown which came out two years later this album is an entirely different beast from Snuff the Punk. I mean, Snuff the Punk is what it is, and it's it's kind of a kind of a time capsule of 1994. But Brown was whenever P.O.D. started sounding like P.O.D. as we know them now. They had a, a strong reggae influence, which wasn't even on Snuff the Punk at all. Like, you'd never get that out of there. But uh, on Brown, they start bringing the reggae influences in. They start bringing in guests. You know, they, they had had a pretty exciting two years between those records. And they had grown as musicians. And this record just sounds like they were having a lot of fun and just throwing out as many different ideas as they could. Yet somehow it's a pretty focused record overall. A little more rage on this one. But the main thing I've noticed so far is P.O.D. has a tempo where they are at their best. And Brown, it wasn't perfect, but they had slowed down. And they will really tap into that on fundamental elements and especially satellite. But this is where the band just lays back a little bit, sets the groove, and what you get is POD. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, Nomi was a little weird. They have the intro and then Nomi's the really the first song on the record. But when you get to Sela and you have that classical guitar intro into the song and you're just like oh oh yeah something has changed about this band and they've honed their sound a little bit and yeah i i it's funny that dan you say this is a more focused record because in a lot of ways it feels a little more disjointed and a little more they're feeling out all the different things they can do and like implementing the reggae and trying to change their sound a little bit but the moments that work like blow you away and you go oh this is a good band yeah i think that was my feeling really when i was listening to it is whenever i say focused i really mean like well for there should always be an asterisk focused for <laughs> pod because the, this <laughs> right. band is, is is infamous for just changing the mood you know within 10 seconds of a song but with brown what i really had going on or what i thought was really good about brown was that they sound more like P.O.D. They sound more original. Yes, you can hear the rage influence. You can hear a lot of that stuff. But on the same token, they are starting to sound more like an original band throughout and have their own style, their own way of kind of going through the waters of creativity. But yeah, sure, there's a lot of different types of stuff on here. Like there's a reggae jam. There's a punk song. There's a uh, there's a funk jam which uh, I was in an old band a while back where we had a funk jam as well. It was not a... Uh, it really must have been a new metal thing. The bass player was good. <laughs> I said that the, our bass player was really good. He really, really carried that one for us. But uh, What about me? Yeah, Joe, you, you, you did good too. <laughs> Thanks, bro. I did not do good. Uh, it was very you bad. I was trying to... I was actually trying to do like a Sonny from P.O.D. thing, and I was like announcing all the band members like he did on Snuff the Punk. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was just it's terrible. And if but you like, contribute $100 to patreon.com forward slash discuss metal, I will let you hear the funk jam. Can't, I can't wait to see how many thousands of people line up to hear that. With POD, though, like this album, one thing I really liked is that they had a few guest uh, vocal appearances. And I don't remember by who because I didn't do good enough homework. My brown liner notes are shredded. Like, so. 
Is Dirt. Brown the album you've listened to the most? Yes. Dirt is on Free Babylon. That's the guest appearance that I remember most from that record. Um, I don't know that there's another guest appearance on that record outside of him doing that. Rap. I think it's him on. Um, uh, I think it's him on Seeking the Wise. Maybe, there's like a spoken. There's like a spoken word part in there uh, where it sounds like him. At least I assume it's the same person. It's really hard to tell, but I, I noticed that right away. I was like, okay, so they, they're bringing in guest vocalists. Or at least just one. But the weird thing about this album, too, is I've heard two versions of it now. There are actually two versions of Brown as well. There's mm-hmm. the original that was put on a Rescue Records. But then, like, I've got this remaster also that, like, the vocals are turned way up. And they added a lot of stuff. Like, we're listening to uh, Breathe Babylon right now. And in the on the CD version I have at the beginning, they're like Babylon, breathe Babylon, like all through the beginning of it. But in the original CD release, it's just the riff, and then the song comes in. They don't have those extra vocals. And then there's another song uh, called Full Color. And on my CD version, they're like, hey, you guys remember how to do that song? And then they do like an acapella version of that song. And then the real song kicks in like 30 seconds later. Mm. But then on the original, it's just the song. So uh, like that's really weird, and it's not really publicized. Like It doesn't say, like, like you can't find any information about it online anywhere, like what the differences were or why they did that. I guess if maybe you'd have to like dig really deep into interviews. It's probably just stuff they did in the studio back in the day. But I would ask the question, why include it now? I don't think anybody was itching to hear P.O.D. basically do a Between the Buried and Me Selkies acapella performance. Well, is that stuff from the Warriors EP version of the song? I don't know. You know it could be. I don't know. Uh, let's pull because, it up because I actually didn't listen to the EP when we did this. Because I know the, the Warriors EP has different versions of Breathe Babylon and uh, Full Color. So gonna, I'm wondering if we're that's We're going to find it. out right now. It has a different version of Satellite or uh, Southbound 2. Oh, okay. That is kind of weird, though, because they, it is on those versions of the song are legitimately on my brown cd so it's not like it's, okay it's not like a weird like limewire thing where i downloaded something way back in the day and then ended up not being the right thing okay okay i'm just i'm just curious uh, yeah no i'm the, curious draw, too. draw the lines a new recording too on that warrior cp oh yeah and it sounds really good which yeah which is amazing the warrior cp which we probably won't go into is amazing and i think it was a lot of people's first real deep dive into pod well yeah because that was the only pod album that was put out on tooth and nail if i'm correct right correct yeah which is weird because i think they would have been a really interesting flagship type of band for tooth and nail at the time Uh, Uh, would not have yeah i think i think pod had bigger hills to climb that tooth and nail could not have gotten them there oh i agree 100 percent. but it just always kind of seemed like tooth and nail wasn't that interested in pod just to do like a one ep kind of deal with them yeah, I'd be curious about that story that we will never get. But <laughs> probably not. Yeah, I mean, you can. There, there's a tooth and nail podcast out now, but uh, I don't know if they're ever going to go over that. You know, like to do a whole episode on one EP, you know, <laughs> might be a waste of somebody's time. But uh, anyway, with Brown, that was my first introduction to the band. I don't want to say it's my favorite album, but it might be purely on the nostalgia alone. I mean, obviously, they got better after this. Like, that was a, let's establish our sound. Let's experiment. Let's see where we can go. And then that's how you move into their major label debut, which was the Fundamental Elements of Southtown. 1999. When this album came out, I was sitting in high school, in my high school math class, actually, and I was listening to some stoner kid trying to explain to another kid why he should listen to P.O.D. And the other kid goes, well, I don't really listen to Christian music. And he goes, the stoner kid's like, yeah, but you got to understand, P.O.D. is hardcore. He goes, how many other Christian hardcore bands are there? And I'm trying not to laugh, you know, but uh, (laughs) he's like, he's like, they're like the first Christian hardcore band. And the guy's like, yeah, but their lyrics are about like religion and stuff. He goes, yeah, but they're hardcore. Like, that's all he could, all he could really muster out of that. And I thought that that was so funny because P.O.D. was just instantly everywhere. I mean, Rock the Party off the hook drops on MTV and suddenly POD is everyone's favorite band. 
And it was the 1999 version of... There are Christian bands that make rock music? Is this a <laughs> thing? Think, well, I think <laughs> the thing that like POD doesn't get enough credit for is breaking that, that ceiling or barrier of like, there's Christian music that isn't shit right like it's like <laughs> right there's a whole lot of it right it was like there's a whole scene and genre and pod was a part of it but then like they come out on atlantic and and they have the video for Southtown, which is making waves but then rock the party comes out and there's this big campaign and they become the number one the only rock video i think or the first rock video to hit number one on uh trl uh with rock the party and it's like they explode and they open up this whole scene for oh christian music like it made it acceptable for you to listen to a band that claimed christianity and it is like it opened up this whole world and and i don't think they get enough credit for that now what helps is that beauty like that album is really good i mean start to finish i think that there are some weird moments on there the, the greetings intro is weird. Checking levels I don't like. All the little instrumental spoken word parts are super weird. But the songs on that record, start to finish, are really good. I mean, Hollywood, Southdown, Rock the Party, Lie Down. Um, the cover of Bullet to Blue Sky, Bullet the Blue Sky, is amazing. Like, in my opinion, better than the original U2 version. I, I agree. I think one. I I'm gonna say this here, and I've said it publicly before. U2 is super overrated, and Joshua Tree is not U2's best record, and I don't understand why people love it. Um, and Pewdie's version of both Blue Sky is definitely better than U2's. But like that whole album is great. It's one of the best sequenced albums out there. The yeah, whole track I, I listing agree. makes sense. It flows. I'm not gonna be cheesy and say it's like it like you're going on a journey. It's not really like that, but just the amount of bangers they hit you with in a row a lot of the time. Like, you almost like they had to have those little weird intros in there in order to break it up because it was so over the top. I mean, even the second half of the album, the B-side, is like, you know, you, you get Lie Down, which is mm-hmm. one of P.O.D.'s heaviest songs. You know, and then you get Lie Down, they, they throw out Set Your Eyes to Zion, but then they just rip you apart with Full of the Blue Sky. You know, um, these are just like the album just kind of goes on and on and on and on. But like, it's all good. Like, I'm never like angry about it. Songs like Image, um, I could do without the Shouts track, but uh, <laughs> but right. I did like, yeah, that's like a carryover from Limp Biscuit. Um, but <laughs> like, you know, Tribal was really good. And then, the, I mean, the closer, Outcast, is just like an incredibly dark song that gets so intense towards its climax that like you're just like holy shit like are you guys sure that i'm listening to like christian music but like it it is that it's like equally zeal and it's heavy and it's heavy about its subject matter but like for whatever reason in 1999 everybody just decided that's okay like i'm not gonna get offended by it because i can relate to it that's one thing i like about pod's lyrics in particular as opposed to other bands that were like them at the time pod's lyrics are about real things like real struggles that people have whereas in a lot of other bands you know like like your corn and lip biscuit and stuff it's all about like well i'm really angry and i have all these imagined slights you know i I think people might be talking shit about me behind my back or something like with pod it wasn't like that like everything seemed so much more real Right. Well, I, and, and we'll talk about this, but I think like Southtown and Satellite, the lyrics on both those records were definitely Sonny's best output as a lyricist as far as whole records were concerned. Um, and yeah, to start that record with Hollywood, with just like guts you and you get the weird vocals at the end and, and that, that same thing that hits you on Outcast at the end, like it's a total record. And I, I remember a friend being like, why did you tell me about P.O.D.? You like Christian music? And I was like, well, I did tell you about P.O.D. And you're just like, oh, Christian Deftones and walked away, right? Like, Oh, no. And then he's like, well, what else do you got? And I was like, well, how heavy do you want to get? How, do you, how deep down the rabbit hole do you really want to go? You know, I was like, well, if you really want to know about good Christian, like, uh, listen to Zayo. Talk to me in a week. Right. Here, here's a Zayo record. Take two of these every night. Call me. Yeah. <laughs> right. just, just let me know, you know. And either that person never talks to you again 
or they're like all about it. This is also the album where everybody kind of noticed what a good rhythm guitarist Marcos is. Mm-hmm. I went out and bought this delay pedal after <laughs> hearing Rock the Party off the hook for the second time, trying to figure out how he made that sound. Oh, yeah. Marcos, especially on this album, his guitar tone, I don't even have the words to really say what I'm thinking. But if you need a guitarist to sit in the mix and not get in anyone else's way, it's difficult to do without having to struggle or fight with the artist because once you get these massive egos, you have to get your shit in, to borrow a wrestling term. Marcos does what he does. He sits in his own little pocket of the mix and he does everything he needs to do. I remember his pedal board being one of the first I ever saw that legitimately surrounded him and had at least 13 pedals on it. And he's just, he's making all these sounds himself. The majority of his guitar parts are not overdubbed. At least they don't sound like they're overdubbed. Most of the time it sounds like him playing the part and what he is able to do with his hands is the part. He might double it to get the full sound, but there's no, I'm going to lay this line up here and then I'm going to play this part higher up and create this harmony and have this little layover effect thing that we got a lot of in hardcore and metalcore in a few years. If Marcos can't play it, you're not hearing it. Right, it's like they finally had the the major label funding to pull off the sound they had been trying to do for two records and they had honed it via touring and for years. I mean, we're talking, what, 94 from Snuff the Punk to 99 on Southtown, like, they had had the years of tour and crafting that sound to know what they wanted and like to build that craft and sound. And they finally had the funding to be able to do it. What's interesting about this album too, is it's a major label debut, but it actually allows them to like, they're allowed to make all their own creative choices. Like I couldn't see a record label executive being like, Hey, that song set your eyes to Zion. Go ahead and leave that on there. That's that's a really cool breakup to the way the song the way the album <laughs> sounds. Like most execs would be like, no, it needs to kind of have the same feeling throughout. Or you know, there's there's the reverse, which we're going to run into later with Pod, where you know y- you can definitely tell that they were kind of restricted creatively on where they could go with certain things. Two thousand and one, satellite. Are you gentlemen ready to set it off? Uh, well, <laughs> I think I was. I like Satellite. At least I really liked it when it came out, and everyone did. It is absolutely the the big-time follow-up to Fundamental Elements, and they really are completely in the pocket. Everything sounds really big. Everything sounds really shiny, for lack of a better word. Like, it's like you took the band from... You basically took the band from Fundamental Elements and, like, cleaned them up real good. Like, 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 now they're all shaved and wearing suits and ready for work, and they're performing better even though i have much more of an emotional attachment to fundamental elements there's no denying that satellite was absolutely crafted to be a hit like from minute one right what you have with satellite is you take this band that's really good and you just strip them of their hardcore roots and i don't mean that in a negative way but you take away that hardcore element of the band and you make them the biggest band in the entire fucking world because that's what they were um at that time and and the record hit at the right time right it comes out on 9 11 which seems unfortunate if you were to craft the narrative but because it's so positive that first single alive like alive hits you and you're like this is what you need in a post 9 11 world and every song set it off alive Boom, Youth of the Nation, Satellite, Messenger. Like, the whole thing is just like, could you, could you write a better, more polished, hard rock record in that time frame? And the answer, I, I just don't think you could have. Um, Youth of the Nation is so overplayed, and I always rate it below uh, fundamental elements of Southtown because of Youth of the Nation, because I just, like, am tired of that song. And the same thing with Boom, because Boom was in, like, every sports arena ever, right? Like, yeah, every yeah. sports compilation video, it's like, 
every big hit, you'd have Pewdie's boom. <laughs> and, um, but those songs you listed back to that record, and you're just like, man, what a great record! It just it just hits on every level. Absolutely, it is such a banger from beginning to end. I mean, even like even though you say they were stripped of their hardcore roots, which is absolutely accurate. Yeah, they still keep it heavy enough for dudes like right. me at the time to be like, okay. You know, these still guys still got it because yeah, sure, you're gonna get a song like Alive, and that's not really my favorite song on the album. But then there's Portrait, there's The Messenger, there's Set It Off. You know, With, some of the without de- job with HR, like I know, right? Like, look at those guys. <laughs> but it's so pod. But it's kind of weird too because, like, as much of a big hit as this album was, there's like some weird shit on this record, like uh, ridiculous is exactly what it sounds like <laughs> like exactly what the title so you get this guy named Ika Mouse that's on the recording and it's like the weirdest craziest thing so when we did the podcast tonight I brought my three year old daughter with me and we were listening to she's in the other room watching uh, some Disney movie uh, not Peter Pan uh, but we uh, but basically we're listening to Satellite going down there and Ridiculous comes on and she's only three she's like dad this is this is a really weird song. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, it's 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 really weird because everything else on it is so modern for 2001 and so like in the pocket for what's cool at that time. And then the song Ridiculous comes on and you're like, what that what the hell is this? And like as an adult, if I heard something like that like for the first time now, I'd be like, I don't have time for this shit. And you know, skip, but like because it was introduced to me at such a young age, I'm like, yeah, no satellite without Ridiculous. That album, that song makes the album. And like part of that is just me being ironic, but like I still actually enjoy listening to it. And I don't know if that's just the magic of POD and Satellite or, or what it is, right. but it is a kind of a strange indicator as to where they're going to go in the future. Like some of the routes that they take on later albums, you can kind of trace back to this creative decision to include this song on the album. I wish there was more to say about Satellite. I mean, who doesn't know Satellite? Who doesn't have a copy of this somewhere, even if it's in an old pile of CDs in the basement? Like, everybody has Satellite. There are two bands that everybody talks about in September of 2001, Power Man 5000 and P.O.D. Right, but Power Man's album didn't get released. And Satellite was the album that everyone needed. Absolutely. Right. It, was, it was so hopeful. Because, I mean, I still felt good listening to it, even this week. Like, you know, I'd, I'd be on my way to work or whatever, and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to be here for like 12 hours. I don't know what's in store for me. And then I'm listening to Satellite, and I'm like, oh, everything's probably going to be fine. You know, like, it, every, everything's cool. It's it's nice outside. It's good. I'm listening to Satellite. You know, the album still has that magic if you're willing to go back that far and, and really listen to it. And it's hard to believe that it's 18 years old. Like, that makes me feel old as fuck. I don't know about you guys. Oh, oh, for sure. Like, like alive still fills you with that like hopefulness and like because I have such a connection with Pod and my dad who recently passed away. Like, those songs mean so much more, and you're just like, yeah, there, there is a hopefulness about it that, yeah, that like on nine eleven, it, it was the perfect record at the perfect time, and like, how how do you script that? <laughs> You don't. It just happens. Either either it's divine intervention or it's not. You know, um, it's either an amazing coincidence or there's some sort of divine thing with it. You know, I always just call yeah. it POD magic. They, they've they've got that magic sometimes. But uh, sometimes. <laughs> well, after this though, I mean, they're the biggest band in the world. Where, you know, where do they go from this? And Marcos pretty much is just like, yeah, I'm I'm gonna quit the band. Maybe that's what or, happened. I don't know if he or was fired. He was fired. Yeah. It depends on what year you ask the members of POD what happened. <laughs> Absolutely right. it is. Well, I remember that was a huge deal. Like, I had a friend that was, like, a huge guitar player nerd. Shout out to Chris Burke. He was, like, a massive Marcos disciple. Like, he he wanted to play like Marcos. He was just, he was all about it. And I wanted to play like him. And I remember I remember doing, like, hey, dude, did you hear that, that Marcos quit POD or got fired from POD or whatever the story was in 2001? Or two, I don't know. I think he left in 02, uh, not a one. But anyway, he goes, you know, they're never going to be able to replace him, right? And I was like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, he's so unique. I learned so much about Marcos from that guy. But uh, he's like, he's so unique, and, and nobody's ever going to sound as good as him. And fuck this band if they try to replace him. They should just break up now and call 
call it a day. And I'm like, well, you know, I mean, they just put out satellite. They, they can't break up. Now, now there's like investors involved, you know, like POD is going to be here for a while. Yeah. POD is not going anywhere. So they, they hire a replacement. I remember they got booked for this Matrix song that they that they were supposed to record. And they ended up saying, like, okay, we, we found a new guitarist. His name's Jason Truby. And, of course, I'm, like, triggered immediately. I'm like, Jason fucking Truby is what you guys actually meant. Um, Hell to the yeah. That, this guy is just the best. Um, I Like, the first three Living Sacrifice albums... I have gone on record. Well, really, the first four is what he was on. But I remember I've gone on record being like, yeah, the vocals are terrible. But, like, man, that guitarist, you know, um, it was it was Bruce and Jason did all the guitar duties for Living Sacrifice up until Reborn and uh, or until after Reborn. But all that cool, creepy, melodic shit on the old Living Sacrifice record, that was all Jason Truby. And it was amazing. So I was already a huge fan of this guy. I know he's a great guitar player. I don't know how he's going to sound in POD because that's like a huge, a huge jump uh, genre wise. Because I'm like, dude, I know this guy. He can he can play a million miles an hour. And I remember they put this song out. Obviously, I didn't expect them to go like metalcore, you know, just because Jason Truby was in the band. Uh, but I was very surprised at how similar they still sounded to their satellite sound. It sounds like P.O.D. Well, the funny thing is, yeah, when they announced Jason Trivia, I was like, oh, they're going to be metal as fuck. <laughs> and, th- and then they put out Sleeping Awake, and I was like, okay, that's a cool song. I dig that song. Like, if that's the direction they're staying, that's great. And then the self-titled record came out, and I was like, well, I, d- I don't like this. <laughs> yeah. Like... When they dropped "Will You," I was like, "Well, this I, I just don't I don't I don't get it." And and the, like execute the sounds, change like the whole thing is the record is very disjointed. It is, and it's it's so I can't I just I'm just gonna say it. It's so boring uh, in yeah. comparison to their other material, which just like old BOD records, like even Fundamental Elements. When I go back and listen to it, I kind of hear stuff that I didn't hear before. Mm-hmm. Like little background noises and just like intricate, like a lot of the shit Joe was talking about with Marcos and all the stuff that he was doing on guitar in the background and the cool sounds that he made. None of that is on the self-titled. Yeah, yeah. And I knew something was wrong right away because like I really anticipated hearing this album and I was actually disappointed that Sleeping Awake wasn't on the self-titled. Like it, I was like, oh, that's not going to be like the lead off single or they're not going to like try to just throw that on there as a bonus track or something. They didn't because it did because it didn't make sense because the record was so different from Sleeping Awake. <laughs> right, Sleeping Awake sounds more like a B side from Satellite than it than it sounds like uh, the self titled. And it's funny because I bought the CD, I put it in, I was so excited, I was about to go on a long car trip, and I was like, "Fuck yeah, me and my POD self titled. That's all I need." I hadn't even heard "Will You" yet, <laughs> so because I, I, I yeah, yeah I tended to do that. So wildfire kicks in, and like literally within like thirty seconds, when he's like, "Give me some of that wildfire," I was like, "Fuck this band!" I just took it out, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, like I'm done. Like, what are you gonna do? You know? So I was like, I was like, okay, maybe it was just a one-off. Sonny's always been kind of weird, you know. <laughs> like, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm gonna give him a pass. So I put the CD back in and I skip, and what follows is just really formulaic generic radio rock with POD's creativity sprinkled in there but it was like their bad creativity <laughs> like the decisions that they like executing the grounds uh, is it executing the grounds or sound the sounds oh the sounds I'm thinking about coffee <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this song is like straight reggae but it's also kind of weird hearing Sonny talk like that because he doesn't really sing like that all the time and it kind of bothers me because it feels like he's just doing a voice which is like a really hypocritical statement coming from me because like obviously Zayo is just doing a voice you know like he doesn't talk like that uh, but for whatever reason for POD it's just not what I wanted uh, you know I was like I was like why are you guys going so heavy with this reggae thing what happened to Southtown you know what happened to just rocking the party what happened to lie down like that that angry aggressive sound but wasn't that the whole problem that people had with them was oh look they're a christian band and they do these funky rhythms no they're not christian they're rastafarian that's not christian yeah they got accused well it kind of is yeah because of the reggae 
visual. I don't know if you can have a visual and an audio record, but... Well, yeah, they had visual issues with both Southbound and this uh, subtitled record, which with the whole visual centering thing is weird in its own right. And, weird, but, goofy. I could say the same thing about some classic Incubus. Well, we we well, like sure, that. But- well, like, there was a whole Christian bookstore uh, cover of Southtown where they edited the artwork so it was just the Indian face because he was levitating. It was, like, some weird mysticism thing that, like, people were offended by. And I don't even remember what was wrong with the self-titled record with the cover art, but that was centered, too. But, like, in hindsight, I've listened to the self-titled record and been okay with it, but, like, when you listen to their discography and you go satellite to the self-titled, you're like, no, this record does not have any of the same punch or um, like you just don't feel it, right? Like there's no like, I agree. sense of urgency or like want there. It like, sounds tired. Right. Like you don't want to listen to it. There's nothing that draws you to it. And that's frustrating because sleeping awake doesn't sound like that. Uh, uh, right, sleeping awake is so compelling, and you're like, "This song is great." All of all of their like one-off singles that they did for movies, like um, whatever it takes, School of Hard Knocks, Sleeping Awake, they're all great, and like none of that urgency is in this record. No, it's and everything's like muted. Like stuff doesn't sound as heavy as it should sound. Like the production's really weird on it. It's like thick and glossy. Like like you're just wading through a sea of shit to hear the songs but like everything's like thick sounding like they're trying to make it sound big like like satellite sounded it's all truby but yeah right that, up front but that's the problem is that jason truby was largely blamed which, for this which album which is unfair is, which i've wondered is part of our perception fan perception of like we expected the band to be x because of truby right and he and like after Post living sacrifice, he's been living in a Phil Keggy world, yeah. and POD is what they are with their influences with Jason Truby in this Phil Keggy like guitar virtuoso world, and we just wanted it to be metal. So, is that our fault for projecting, or is it just the band never lived up to what they had been? If this record was legitimately good and people just hated it for some arbitrary reason which unfortunately does happen a lot i would agree with that that it would that it's just our projection of what we wanted the album to be the album itself is very slow it's boring it doesn't even hold a candle to what satellite was so if you only use satellite as your measuring stick you're going to be disappointed like no matter what you're going to be disappointed with this album I think even if Marcos had been in the band and it sounded note for note the same, I would feel the same right. way about it. But I, I, maybe I'm going to jump ahead here. They improved on Testify. Ooh, I was yeah. waiting for somebody to bring it up. So I'm, I'm back and forth on Testify. 2006. Me, me too. It takes me in a lot of weird emotional places. Ag- agreed. <laughs> First of all, sorry. <laughs> that self-titled man just puts me to sleep every time. It's not their best. Not at all. <laughs> On Testify, though, somebody came to their senses and was like, dude, you guys have to put out a record that like sounds kind of like Satellite. Like, or maybe even some of your older sounds, like bring some of that shit back because people are rioting. I don't even think Testify sounds like Satellite, but I just think like there is a an urgency on Roots and Stereo, which which I know we've, we've made fun of up to this point. Like, yeah the whole modest yahoo edition but like roots and stereo instantly grabs your attention in a way that nothing on the self-titled record did well yeah that's that's because they it instantly sounds like pod again right <laughs> you know it's new pod it's right. not like this weird experimental thing that they did with some chick with a butterfly wings on it you know like it's not it's not trying to be something it's not. It is unabashedly POD right. on Testify. Yeah. And I think largely that's why it succeeds. Roots and Stereo, when that chorus kicks in, like, I'm like, yeah, this is cool. Like, how, how smooth the chorus is. It's got that It's got that harmonized vocal that 
they started using a lot more later in their career, and I think it sounds really good and was a great addition to their sound. And it's so weird, too, being a kid listening to something like Brown and then listening to Testify and being like, yeah, this sounds like P.O.D. Because it sounds nothing like Brown. But they've done such a good job of convincing me of what the P.O.D. sound is <laughs> that I'm, I'm okay with it. Right, and even like... I think Goodbye for Now is a fantastic song. Oh, my goodness. Where they, yeah. they tapped into that, their pop sensibility side, that youth of the nation thing where you're like, this is super catchy and it's it's exactly the song for the moment. And it has Katy Perry on it, which Who has was been nobody controversial at the time. in its own right. <laughs> yeah, she was like nobody at the time. Yeah. I remember um, our, our buddy Scott Bowling had Sonny from P.O.D. on his show, Good Company with Bowling, which is like a YouTube show. And uh, he sat down and talked with, P- with Sonny face to face. And Sonny was saying how like, you know, we had this girl that hung out at the studio with us like the whole time we were doing Testify. And, you know, we called her like a studio rat, you know, like she just hung out and she'd like, she'd like bring us food and stuff and, you know, like just hang out. And uh, he's like, and who knew, and who knew that that girl, that, that girl that we called a studio rat became Katy Perry. Because it's weird though. Cause like when I call, she doesn't, she doesn't answer anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I've, Which, I've seen Katy Perry live. She's amazing. Oh, she's so. incredible. I mean, she, oh my God, like, that range. As, as a performance artist, she's fantastic. Isn't like, she on the list of people that can actually pull it off live? I think I, so. I, I would assume. I don't. When you're in a big, giant stadium like that, you have no idea what is actually going on. Like, I've seen Taylor Swift in the stadium, too. It's like, you have no idea. But, like, I, I think that's the other thing that, like, separates POD. This is going back to something not on topic with the record, but, like, they're really good live. Oh, yeah, incredible. Like, and, the and energy is off the charts. Them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they, they're almost like they're like they're playing more pop hits, but, like, they're still very much that band that put out Snuff the Punk. <laughs> you know, like, they're... Right, yeah, yeah, You know, they're all over the place, and they have no problem, like, digging really deep back into their catalog, which I always appreciate. Yeah. Testify is really a return to form for them, and I think for all the Jason haters out there that were like, he's never going to be as good as Marcos or whatever. He does a very serviceable job on this record as far as also having the POD sound. And you you might be able to blame some of the issues with the self-title on the fact that he just wasn't acquainted with the band yet. You know, he hadn't, he hadn't sat in a room with them forever, you know, hashing out song ideas and, and getting a feel for what POD was all about. So, like, I, I give him a little bit of credit there. But I think he sounded a lot better on this record. Um, and it, it's hard to say because it's like I, I'm criticizing Jason Truby, who is a better guitar player than I will ever be, you know, and is a guy that I have massive respect for. But he sounds really good on this album. And it's just weird that I'm giving him an attaboy for playing like this type of rock when I've heard him play shit that's just like so technical. The thing I feel worst about for the the Truby years of VOD is like his best songs were Sleeping Awake on the Matrix soundtrack and Going in Blind on their greatest hits. Yeah. Atlantic years. So like I'm like your two best songs were compilation songs. Yeah. It's unfortunate. But, yeah. But it is what it is. I mean POD is very much Marco's band as far as the guitar sound and the way everything was presented. And I think that Jason did a really serviceable job of continuing on with that tradition. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like you hire Jason Truby. Like you really kind of can't go wrong. Um, This record though, I go in a lot of different directions with it. I think the first half, like the, the A side of the record is really good. The B side, on the other hand, you've got songs like on the grind, which is just a really weird song. Um, it's interesting. I, it's weird because like the first time I heard it, I was like, what the fuck? And then I've listened to it a bunch more times and I was like, no, yeah, I kind of like this. And I do think that it is on brand for POD. I think teachers is a great song. Yeah. Teachers is great. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, the only issue I really have with this song is that or not song, uh, this album is that they never go heavy again. No. Like in comparison to Satellite, which still had songs like Portrait and The Messenger and like a whole bunch of you know, like set it off, like really heavy songs with screaming. Um, as Mead Haddish as that sounds, that did used to actually be part of the POD sound. And, and now it's just not there at all. So what you get with this is kind of a 
it's a POD that you need to kind of get used to because that's probably what you're going to be with stuck with for the next few albums. And some days I'm into it because I still like the smooth POD. I like the smooth and the heavy POD. I'm fine with with both. But like Satellite was smooth and heavy and and testifies not not at all. It is smooth but not heavy, right? So like yeah. you can find that balance, which I think they do later, but do you think that Testify would have been a much smarter follow-up to Satellite? Because I almost see Testify as the natural progression from Satellite, whereas the self-titled is just kind of off on the side. I think we would have hated it. I think Testify would not have played well post-Satellite. There was no way to follow up Satellite. Right. In a post marcus world, there was no way to follow up Satellite. And I think Testify, Ruth and Stereo would not have played well as the first track on a POD record after Satellite. You'd been like, what after the set fuck it is off? this? After Set It Off? Yeah. Right? right. You'd be like, who are you guys? So, <laughs> so do you think do you think that Testify largely succeeded then because they had had kind of a, a bad album before that and then we were just happy that they sounded like P.O.D. again? I don't know. Testify came out and I largely ignored it because I was so turned off and my musical styling had shifted from P.O.D. where I did not even mess with Testify when it came out. Sure. It only came to it later. Where I was like, I had heard Goodbye For Now and, and Roots and & Stereo and I was like, oh, those are fine. But like, I was not invested in P.O.D. in the same way I'd been with Satellite because the self-titled had turned me off and music had so shifted in those few years so quickly. Right. Um, yeah. So so I, I don't know how that relates because I come to testify later and I look back on it with more hindsight. All of this is looking back on hindsight. Oh, but yeah. like, That's this whole show, dude. Well, well I know, but like, in the moment, I, I didn't give Testify two cents because I was like, I don't care about POD anymore. Right. You'd when move, that you'd record moved came on. out, I was I had moved on. Well, unfortunately, we have to keep moving on. 2008, when angels and serpents dance. Hey, guys, Marcos is back. You can't yeah. tell. He came back, and I was in, instantly interested again. I was like, oh, what are they going to do now? Yeah, and then they put this album out. I think it's half good. It is much better when I listen to it this time than it was the first time I listened to it. Maybe I just know more about music. Like, cause like now when I listen to music, I tend to like criticize it and take notes and try to find the good and the bad, you know, but like back when this came out, I was still just a general general music fan. And so I was like, this is not the POD that I signed up for. I'm out. That's fun because what I still, when I listen to music, like, I just put it on and whatever my general impression is, is how I try to take it in. And sometimes you just know, you listen to a record and you're like, I'm going to like this record better later. I don't like it now, but I'll like it better later. When Angels and Serpents Dance is a very emotional record. It also is very stripped down. In its approach, it's very like bland sounding. Like, like look at the production quality is a little bit flat, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It do, it's not like really effects heavy like uh, Testify was or like Satellite was. It's very much focused more on the instrumentation. I actually found it to be pretty enjoyable because the lyrics do seem really emotional and really deep, but the songwriting itself isn't very compelling. What, what do you mean when you say songwriting? I mean that the songs don't really have the hooks in them that that they had on that they had on like testify or on uh satellite like i can like i've listened to this album four times this week and i couldn't like really remember any of the choruses but like the other albums like even the bad ones i, I couldn't get out of my head see i would disagree because i think like addicted shine with me the title track like all of those songs like i think the hooks on those songs are great and you have like Paige hamilton from uh helmet well that oh, one God yeah forbid. that, that like, one was cool. that's yeah. super cool but i think i think there are great hooks on this song i think there are songs on when angels and serpents dance that stick to you where i lose the songwriting is with what pod did when marcus came back for a long time which was like every song starts with a guitar riff and then builds from there it's like every song was this dun, 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 and then like went from his guitar riff was the intro and everything was the same 
and there was no diversity in their songwriting. That's where I lost songwriting. Um, but I, I, I think, I mean, there are some like stinkers of songs like California IA oh my uh, God. is a terrible song. <laughs> they're, uh, they're starting to reach, I can't a, reach rain a... every day. Like, yeah. like there are songs like that are not good on this record. And it was, it, it is a problem that would be POD later. But I think like Addicted, Shine With Me and, and the title track, I think they're all like, it's like, okay, this is what the band could be. This is what we're building towards. It's not a good record, but there are good songs on it. Well, and that's the whole thing is that you have to look at where we're at now. Well, before we had entire albums that were good. You know, I don't, right. I don't skip a whole lot on Satellite. I don't skip a whole lot on Fundamental, fundamental Elements. I don't really skip a lot on Brown, really. Mm-hmm. So now we've got an album that like three or four of the songs are good. So it's one of those like, at that point, you would put on an EP with your best of material. Right, which might might make it par for the course. Right. For what they had been doing. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm more compelled by these songs for whatever reason. They're, to me personally, I'm more compelled by the songs that work on this album than what they were on the self-titled or testify. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I can give you that for sure. Like, I, I kind of agree in 2019 in that I when I listened to this for the podcast specifically, I did find it more enjoyable than I did the very first time. Cause the first time I'm just a meathead and I'm like, where's the heavy, you know? And it's oh, funny though, because this album is actually heavier than testify in places, right. you know, um, you, you can't have Paige Hamilton on and, and write like a shitty ballad. However, this album, for whatever reason, didn't catch on for me. Like I said, there were some good songs because at the same time, POD is still a very high caliber band. So like, I still don't think yet that they've released an album that is just total shit from beginning to end. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I still don't feel that way. Like, spoilers, throughout their whole discography, I don't feel that way. However, we get into murdered love and mistakes were made. I disagree. Let's Ladies go. and gentlemen, Let's 2012, go. are you ready to kill love? Or murder love? Because if you just say kill, that could still be like a unintentional manslaughter kind of kind of deal. But this is straight up murder, like premeditated. Some Tim Lambisa shit. Oh, <laughs> yeah, oh shit. <laughs> he, he who shall not be named Tim Lambisa. Uh, uh, but I hate to, uh, Anyways. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you read the uh, article from uh, that interview I did with Scott Mellinger about Tim Lambisa's? I did. It's one of the very first interviews I've ever done where like somebody said something so funny that like it blew up. <laughs> It has been requested that Tim does an interview on As the Story Grows, and I said, fuck you. Yeah, I don't want to talk to that guy. Fuck him. I was I was like, that would be really great for ratings, but no. No. I got, no. He could either take the easy way out or not, right? Right. All right. Murder love. But <laughs> okay. Um, let's not talk you want to start? You want me to start? You you start because I'm curious about what you have to say and why you don't like this. I love the first five songs on this album. I think it play. It's really cool. Like when I when I heard the single "Murdered Love," I was like, "The boys are fucking back." You know, this is awesome. Uh, I, even though I really didn't care so much for the delivery, the way the verses are delivered is kind of weird. But like, I get what they're doing. It's just not my preference. So I'm not gonna shit on it. But it definitely wasn't my present. It wasn't my preference. But I love the chorus. It just sounds so pod, so in the pocket. And I'm like, oh my god. If this whole album sounds like this, I'm going to shit. Uh, I did not shit. And that's because the rest of this album does not sound like this. But it is still it's, it is still really good, but not for the reasons that I... It's kind of like a bait and switch. Like, it's a good record, but it's not good for the reasons that I was led to believe it was going to be good. That's fair enough. I remember I saw them live, and they played On Fire. I remember okay. being like, okay... It's a good song. Like, there's nothing remarkable about it when they played it live. You're just like, okay, it's a good song. And then they released Lost in Forever. And I was like, oh, this this hits on a super catchy hook, like a great guitar riff. Like, Lost in Forever is that satellite type single. Like, it has everything. And I was instantly hooked. Murder, yeah, Murder Love, that thought was great. Um, yeah, I, I mean, the record, like, start to finish, like, Eyes is fine, like it's a good song. Higher, 
like West Coast Rock Steady, I don't love. Um, but I think overall, start to finish, like when you look at POD with Marcos, like it was like with uh, when Angels and Serpents dance, they're trying to feel their way through the relationship again. And then when Murder Love came out, you're like, oh, they found it and this works. And I am like the only beef I have with I am is I wish they would not have edited the song. And like, well, they backed what? out on it too. And, and there's a ver. Apparently, there was a vinyl version that was released, and somebody put it up on YouTube where uh, Sunny saying "fuck" is not edited out of the song, which sounds a lot better. But even then, even with the edited, and like the funny thing is, my brother bought the CD from a Christian bookstore, and he's like, "That song's not even on my album." And I'm like, "Well." That's the best song on the record, so you got the wrong version. <laughs> um, Undoubtedly. Even, the even best song edited, record. I think I Am is so good and so compelling. And you're like, it just feels like there's a confidence there that they did not have, where they're just like, we can do whatever we want because it doesn't matter anymore. Yes and no. Like, that is how it comes across when you hear the album or you hear the song. And I will tell you, I Am is is definitely one of the best songs on the album, if not the very best. Yeah. But, like, they kind of went at it a little bit half-assed in that, like, they they announced, like, we're going to have a song on it where we say fuck. And everybody's like, why would you do that? And by everybody, I mean, like, they're Christian fans. Because I hate to say it, but, like, by this point in their career, a lot of the fans that they gained with Satellite and Fundamental Elements are largely gone. gone. They have the, They still have the Christian community to rely on. So to be that brash and to be like, yeah, we're going to say fuck on an album. Like, yeah, I'm sitting there being like, yeah, dude, say whatever you want. Because it is, in a lot of ways, one of the most honest P.O.D. songs you've heard in a long time. Like, it's gimmickless. And it's very, like, it's very religiously zealous, too. So, like, the Christian fans really should be behind a song like I Am. Uh, But for whatever reason, they're not because there's this arbitrary thing in there that that they can't look past. But yeah, I think the decision to edit it was stupid because that was kind of them going back on the bold choice that they made. And then if you buy the deluxe version of this album, this song's not even on it and is instead replaced with two other songs, which I'm like, that's the very first time I've ever heard an album with a cut song be referred to as deluxe. Like deluxe means I got like all the B-sides and shit too, right? So like, I feel like they they half-assed it with that because like at some point, because if they they had wanted to, they could have just been like, no. This is what we released. We stand by it. And I'm curious why we would come out and announce that we're going to do something controversial. Be- because you have to try to soft the blow some way for your more conservative Christian fans. That's that's why. Because you're trying to soften the blow and and to say it's it's edited. It's there, but it's edited. Like you're trying to soften the blow to make people okay with it, even though there was going to be this whole record release that didn't include it. But like, it's a way to say, yeah, we did this, but like, it, it's to try to not kill what you have, which all of, all of that might suck, but it does not change how I feel about the record and that song. Like what they did going into it does not change how I feel about the song in general and the album as a whole. That record is the closest you're going to get to Satellite, right? A hundred percent, yeah. Like, it really is. And they're... I, I can understand them editing it, but at the same time, it's still like... And again, yeah, it, it, the rest of the album is not affected by all of this. This is just like a side arbitrary thing. But it's so funny that, like, to me, I just feel like if, if the attitude was like, well, we don't give a shit, we're just going to say what we want to say... Like, they're not the only Christian rock band to ever put a cuss word on their album. Like, you know, like, there was no... that. Like, Norma Jean said fuck on their newest album, and nobody said anything. Right, <laughs> you know? right. I didn't even realize it was on that song, and I'd listened to that record a thousand times, and then somebody mentioned it as an aside, and I was like, Norma Jean dropped an F-bomb? Like, I know Corey curses all the time, but, like... I listened to the record, I was like, oh, no, of course you did. Everybody course keeps did. telling me that, too, and I've listened to it probably equally as much he's not saying it it actually sounds more like he's saying i'm not fapping around which is even funnier <laughs> uh-huh. 
and probably even worse. Hey y'all, it's like even more cool, dude. If he if, if he really did if he really did say fapping, <laughs> like do that in your private. Yeah, if he actually <laughs> if he actually said fapping, then like that's like even more Corey. If you ever followed Corey Brandon on Twitter, it's a uh, it's it's a experience. <laughs> I could say that their next album, The Awakening was very different for P.O.D. I never thought P.O.D. would ever attempt to put out a concept album. This album is filled with sound, like it's not even sound samples, because it's not like just out of context clips. Like they had actors perform lines and like they, they made all of this content to go in addition to the actual music. And it's kind of your like post-apocalyptic New World Order. Uh, it's actually very Christian if you read the lyrics, because they talk about like the New World Order and the end times and all that stuff. This was so weird, and I was not expecting this album to sound like this, because to be honest with you, before we did this episode, I had not heard it. Like, I didn't know that it existed. So, in saying that I've only listened to it once or twice, I'm going to take my own stab at it. This is kind of cool, but at the same time, as far as the songwriting goes, the P.O.D. that's hiding in all of this, they're telling an extremely dark, gritty story but they're still making like POD decisions with some of the song choices. So like, I feel like sometimes the theme that they're putting forward in the, in the album does not match up with the actual theme of the songs being played. If you cut out all of the weird skip parts between the songs, I think it's a better record than it plays. All, all of the spoken word skip parts are terrible straight up. And it's, it's like every time I listen to this record, it, I have mixed feelings because I think they're good songs, but I think what they tried to do was it was too far. I wasn't a fan of it when it first came out. Getting to listen to it again this week, I like it more, but it's Travis's fault. Travis introduced me to Candiria. I don't get a Candiria vibe listening to this album, but I want to hear that type of concept in it. It's a heavy metal album that has dramatized pieces thrown in for creative reasons. The music fan, the heavy metal fan in me, wants to complain about that because once I hear it once and I can't skip it, if I don't want to listen to it again, I get frustrated. If I, if I want to just listen to the song Am I Awake, I can't because I have to listen to the extra stuff. Right, I mean, that's 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 what I'm saying. If you cut out all of that extra stuff, all the voice actors, all the, it would be a better album. Like, Am I Wake's pretty good. This goes out to you, like, okay, it's their pop single, it's fine. Criminal Conversations with Maria Brink, great. Revolution with Lou Collar, great. Like, they're good songs on here and if they just told their story without like hammering the point home like you're too stupid to get it so here's these skits in between to so you know what's going on like that ruins it my biggest issue is that they're not even in between they weren't even nice enough to separate them into separate tracks that i could skip right there or they're make a fucking in the yeah I, like i yeah. what i wanted to do is make a fucking playlist that just had the songs on it that I could just can't. listen to freely. And they're like, no, we're, we're making this creative decision for you because fuck you, Dan. That's why. I'm sure that's exactly what they thought when they were putting it on. I don't have a lot to say about it. It has some good songs on it, but it's kind of been the trend with a lot of POD albums for the past three or so where you've got like four or five good songs on a good on a good album. But in on kind of the worst ones, there's like maybe only three. It becomes really hard to take this band seriously when they're like, okay, guys, it's 2018 and we're going to put out an album that is like totally a return to form because they've kind of been feeding us that line of bullshit for a while now. So with Circles, I went into it being like, you know what? I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. And unfortunately, I was a little disappointed because I feel like there are moments on this album that are very much that comeback. However, in 2018, for whatever reason, Sonny's lyrics have kind of deteriorated for me like he used to sound really cool and modern and now his stuff just comes across as pure cheese i i think it's a throwback because like the lyrics that are on circle and some of the lyrics that are on when angels and serpents dance and some that are on murdered love like if you look back to brown 
and to snuff the punk like it's kind of the same sort of thing this like call and response of like our name and like referencing where you're from like it's it's a weird throwback where it's like he's never evolved like he has these moments and i think like south town and satellite he was killing it but and those were the best albums lyrically that we've gotten from him but like yeah lyrically i i i try not to judge records in Instinctively on the lyrical content because I'm like that's not what's drawing me in anyways so I try to ignore that but with bands like P.O.D. it's hard because it's such it feels like it's such an important part to it it's clear and, it's not growled vocals you can't really ignore what he's saying necessarily but yeah circles circles is fine it's middle of the ground I didn't love it but it was like it's fine it's P.O.D. I don't hate it like it's enjoyable enough like I'm not gonna delete it from my iTunes library but it's like it's there the only difference was the closing track on the album when home came on I was like holy fuck P.O.D. went like super hardcore on this song (laughs) I was very surprised it was one of those like hey are you still awake kind of moments right and I was completely shocked whenever I heard it because I was like holy shit guys like is this like some kind of lead in? Please tell me this is where you're going musically. <laughs> right. It's like you wish you'd, they had done a whole album like that because it's so interesting and heavy and compelling. And you're like, why did you wait for this to be the last song on the album? You could have done this shit with Truby four albums ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, so true. So frustrating, though. Like, it's it's great, but it also is very much like I had to wait through an entire album for this. Some of it was good and some of it wasn't so good. And then you give me this fucking awesome closing song and it's like, well, that's it. Good night. Right. (laughs) But we can look at this in a totally different perspective too, though, because I've complained throughout this whole discussion about how, oh, well, there's only three or four songs that sound like the old stuff or whatever. But at the same time, all artists change. Their sound will change over time. This is a constant. There's no way around that. So in a certain sense, shouldn't POD be complimented in that they still take a little bit of time out despite their experimentation to still give the fans what they expect to get from POD? I think so. If you're a fan of this band and you've been around this long, you listened through the Jason Truby years and you were excited when Marcos came back, you need to allow the band to do what they want. And honestly, I think they deserve respect for giving everybody that one thing that they like from the last album, Norma Jean did the same thing. They just do it at the top of the record. Yeah, but they actually said fuck, Joe. Or fap. Jerry's still out. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, that last Norma Jean record was uh, is definitely their worst record. Oh. In, in my opinion. You and Joe might have to fight later. That's Joe's favorite record by Norma Jean. <laughs> I'm coming to your house. Just uh, hey, that's, that's a long drive. Real quick, I know I know this is a side. What makes you think I'm gonna drive? I know this is a side story, but what album so would you important. consider to be Norma Jean's best album? I'm super unpopular. I'm very emo. It's Anti Mother. So okay, no, I mean, it's, we, well, it's, it's a mix between Anti Mother and Meridional. So both of the I go back and forth on those two, but but those are one and two. That's Any respectable. That's respectable. Don't be surprised if there's a shark at your job on Monday. Well, I like wrongdoers a lot, too. But, yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm a meathead, so my favorite album is Bless the Murder, Kiss the Child. But we did that episode already, so we'll go past it. Let's just (laughs) say this. I love Bless the Murder, Kiss the Child, but to be honest, it's a completely different band (laughs) like than what Norma Jean is, you know, now. I I think Corey, Norma Jean, and The Chariot were both better than Bless the Murder. Okay, that's fine. There there, there you go. That's fine. That's, that's, That's it. It's nostalgia. I also don't think Reborn's a very good record, but really, you like the hammering yeah. process a lot more. I do too. Um, yeah, they were still finding their footing because Reborn was largely just a thrash album with hardcore screaming on it, yeah. and thrash okay. is great, but kind of boring too. Hammering process had a lot more elements to it; it had a lot more going on for it. Anyway, now that we're done revisiting, yeah. now that we're yeah. done yeah. revisiting <laughs> past episodes we've done, but we didn't talk about it with Brian, so it's it's new. It's an exclusive. Final thoughts on P.O.D. Ooh, final thoughts. Brian Patton of As the Story Grows. 
Oh man, man, I, I think they've, they've had a long career and they've, they've continued to release great songs throughout that career. Uh, it's been inconsistent at times, but I, you're not going to deny their legacy and I think they continue to release good songs. And, and what more could you want? Dan, what about you? What more could I want? I want a lot of things. <laughs> I want every band to play exactly what I want them to play. In the case of POD, I largely agree, though. I don't think that they have ever had a massive falling from grace. I don't think that they've ever been, like, total shit. Like, they released an album where I'm like, what the actual fuck were you thinking? I, I never have that with POD because a lot of the elements of POD that we talk about that are, like, weird or out in left field aren't really all that weird not a left field because you can go back to snuff the punk and brown and find them you know it's all there in the beginning uh, a lot of the times i've been using on episodes about how certain bands have a grab bag of different tricks that they use throughout their career and pod all the elements have always been there no pun intended uh they, they've always been there you just have to look far enough and they've taken some of those ideas further than i think maybe they should have but I wasn't the one making the creative decision. So, you know, it's all good. I think as long as I get a few tracks that I can bob my head to and really get behind, I think I'm always going to give the new POD album a chance. I think POD plays a style that is unique to them. There are similarities to other bands, Rage Against the Machine, Bad Brains in the early days, Project 86 at times. But for the most part, if you listen to P.O.D., you know it's P.O.D. Nobody has that reggae-influenced vocal delivery mixed with groove, hard rock, heavy metal. And as far as I'm aware, it's the same members that have been in the band for over 20 years. So if you're a fan of bands that don't change, P.O.D. is going to make you a little upset because they've changed quite a bit but they still try to do enough of that thing that you like to keep you coming back. So listen to P.O.D. Dan, what's your album of the week? Oh, man. Well, my album of the week, we've been doing this new metal deep dive. It's so funny, too, because this is like new metal May or whatever, but like we really haven't really been like, this is a very new metal because P.O.D. largely kind of isn't that. Like they kind of were at first, and I understand how they were associated with the scene of new metal bands in the early days, but for the most part, their career really isn't new metal. But because we are listening to new metal, I get to my album of the week, uh, which is actually Headspace by Pulse Ultra. I've been uh, revisiting that one. I'm surprised you would even take one minute of your life to listen to that album again. I like the first two tracks, and I kind of like track three now, so we're making progress. Brian, what about you? And I've been spinning the new Get Up Kids record, Problems, which uh, officially released the day that we're recording this, uh, called Pro Did I say it? it's called Problems? Uh, uh, problems, yeah. Uh, so, new Get Up Kids record. They, they've been at, at uh, this for a long time, and uh, they've kind of returned to that form of uh, early punk rock emo sound, and, and I love it. It's been, it's been great. I've been spinning the vinyl a lot lately. Very cool. Mine would be Adam Ship, The Crash of 47. It's with, if you want to hear us talk to the drummer of Adam Ship, you can find that on episode 47. Is that right? Not even close, Not dude. even close, sorry. <laughs> I, dude, once we got over 100, I was like, I don't, I don't know, an episode we did in the past Did we talk time. about that band? Yeah, we talked about that band. And <laughs> Is then this going to be a revisited or a re-revisited album? We will do that sometimes. We're like, well, I just want to talk about this band again. And so we will. It's even more fun if you like make your opinions opposite of what they were on the original episode and just don't say anything. On on the As the Story Grows uh, like Simplecast page for all the podcasts, it was, I guess, originally the uh, what, Black Vinyl Club. Black podcast. Vinyl Collective. Yeah. Collective, whatever. So like we're 20 episodes ahead of the As the Story Grows quote unquote chapters. So I'm always like, episode 182, epi chapter 162. <laughs> That's when you're like, it's just whatever it's you guys want. Weird. Just say it in a, like a drunken slur. It's whatever you guys want it to be. Oh, I did. Somebody, Travis messed up on his final episode. And somebody was like, hey, the chapter's wrong for where you were. And I was like, 
That was his fault. <laughs> There's a reason that guy's not on the show anymore. Yeah, it's he the keeps old, messing up. It's the old guy. Me, me. That's, that's the old guard who hated social media and why the show isn't popular. We're no, under. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I know. We're under new management now. That's how you just have to respond. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. People in those days uh, originally were not happy that we were under new management, but that's okay. Yeah, we weren't over. past that. <laughs> People wanted him to uh, Jay Leno the show when Conan O'Brien took over the Tonight Show, and they're like, "Just be Jay Leno and come back until you find a better host." That was right. an actual email I got, and I was like, "Well, Travis doesn't run this email anymore, so thank you." Yeah, thanks. The guy that you were just talking shit on is the guy that got this email, so fuck you a lot. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hey Good Brian, time. thanks for doing this with us, man. Always, always, it's so fun. I love it. It is super fun. It's even more fun when we have conflicting opinions. I, I agree. Because like with the mutual respect, there, it's like, well, I'm not going to call him a fucking idiot. Of course, <laughs> right. I did do that to Jeff, which might have been why you left. I don't know. <laughs> Those didn't count. Oh, hey guys and girls, it's not just a guy thing. Did you know that you could reach out to discography discussion in a variety of different ways? People are always asking me, hey Dan, can I request a band? for you guys to talk about on the show even if you've never heard them before and i'm like yes absolutely you can do that and one of the ways that you can do that is you can email us at dan and joe show at gmail.com you can reach out to us on facebook which is facebook.com slash discography discussion we have a official facebook group for discography discussion just click to join it and i will let you into the group unless you're a weird spammy porn bot in which case i'll probably just creep on it for a little while and then deny it or accept it depending on how i'm feeling the other thing that you can do is we have a discord server for discography discussion there's going to be a link in the show notes if you click on that you will be invited to our discord server that is an open chat that is going 24 hours a day seven days a week so if you guys want to talk to us that way you can i have it on my phone so i can respond to you pretty much anytime i'm not asleep oh and you can also follow us on twitter at discuss metal and on that note, this has been episode 117 of Discography Discussion. Thank you for listening. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Discuss Metal. Subscribe to our podcast everywhere you listen to podcasts, including Google Play, iTunes, and Stitcher. Visit DiscussMetal.com for all things Discography Discussion. And please send questions and comments to Dan and Joe Show at gmail.com. If you are not a patron, you can become one at patreon.com forward slash discuss metal. We have some sweet perks. Give me your money. Oh, new metal. Oh, yeah. Brian Patton and As the Story Grows can be found at asthestorygrows.com. Subscribe everywhere you listen to podcasts. Yeah, but before I uh, was host of As The Story Goes, Travis, when he would do interviews, he would be like, cut this out, Brian, while he was talking to whoever the guest was. And oftentimes it would be interesting enough where I would just be like, cut out him telling me to cut it out and just leave whatever he said in, because I'm like, this is good. I don't know. <laughs> did, he, did he ever come back and be like, why the hell did you cut that out? Uh...